Good evening, uh, Professor Thormson, uh, Your Excellency, Sir Sebastian, Lady Wood, and Mr. Crack, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for this invitation to visit Berlin and for the very kind hospitality. I've had a really enjoyable um, uh, uh, couple of days here. It is, of course, a very particular honor to be invited to give the Queen's lecture. And I'm absolutely thrilled to see so many people here to support this event today. Thank you very much for your time in what I know are very, very busy diaries. As you've already heard, my day-to-day -day job is as a nutrition scientist, and so it's perhaps no surprise that I stand here and say to you that I think diet really matters for health. But the good thing is that that's not just the view of a nutrition evangelist. I'm supported in that view by a huge piece of work which was done by a group of scientists and economists from across the world and known as the Global Burden of Disease Study. What you see here on the left is the uh, risk factors for poor health expressed as disability-adjusted life years. And on the left-hand side with the global analysis, what you can see is that malnutrition does remain the single biggest threat but other dietary risk factors are not so far behind. And indeed, we've already passed the point at which the global population of people who are overweight exceeds those who are underweight. And so I think we, we can be pretty sure that the pattern of diet-related disease is going to change very, very fast at a global level. So today, I want to focus on the issues which we face in high-income countries, which, oops, sorry. We, oh. <laughs> on the issues that we face in high-income countries, which are shown on the uh, right-hand side of this, uh, of this chart. And here what we see is that diet-related diseases are second only to the harms caused by tobacco. And the risk is primarily of non-communicable diseases, particularly cardiovascular disease, but also diabetes and some cancers. And I might also add that these dietary risks are independent of the impact of diet, which is mediated through excess energy intake and obesity. And if we were put to put those two together, it would be the single most important risk factor for poor health. So I think there's very, very little doubt that this is an issue which really commands our attention. But is it, is it a question for science? Well, sometimes when I look at the papers, I think scientists don't really need to worry about this at all because there's absolutely no shortage of advice to the public about what to eat. Plenty of other people are doing this job for me. And the internet and social media, of course, have given a worldwide platform to a whole community of people who have views about diet and health. Now, everybody is entitled to an opinion, and I certainly don't want to prevent that. But what I think scientists uniquely should bring to the debate is empirical evidence. And what we need to do is to separate the evidence from the emotion or indeed the anecdote. And I don't think there is a single piece of evidence that will tell you that mushrooms can do all that's claimed here. <laughs> that said, as scientists, we don't always help our own cause. Many of these headlines have been driven by over-enthusiastic press releases. And the problem is that the public feel battered by inconsistent information. And this is not harmless. It fuels mistrust in science. And for those people who are ambivalent about dietary change, and let's face it, most of us are, if you see this kind of diversity of views, what happens is it can encourage you to avoid taking any action at all today. Because, as I've heard so many times, not least from my own family, we will wait until the scientists can agree. So this is a huge, huge problem for us in trying to get evidence-based um, information into both policy and practice. So let me turn now and have a look and try and strip out the emotion and just look at what the scientific evidence tells us about the principal dietary risk factors. Which parts of our diet should we be concerned about? <laughs> 
Well, this is data from the UK, which is extracted from that global burden of disease study I mentioned earlier. And I think much of this will be very unsurprising. We eat too little fruit and vegetables, too little fish, too little dietary fiber, and we eat too much sodium or salt, as it occurs mostly, and too much red and processed meat. So far, no surprises. But notice at the top of the list, we have diets low in whole grain. So that implies we need to eat more carbohydrate, the fiber-rich types of carbohydrates. And that doesn't sit very easily with the prevailing media view that actually low-carb diets are where it's at. Meanwhile, sugar-sweetened beverages are at the bottom of the list. And sugar, more generally, doesn't feature as a risk factor at all. Now, I'm certainly not here to let sugar off the hook, but I will argue that it's just one of the dietary issues that we need to address to improve health, and that a unique focus on sugar might actually distract us from some of the other important issues that we need to consider. Suggesting that sugar isn't uniquely harmful is not always a popular position at the present time, and that leads me to another example of what I think is, is some of the emotion which is really besetting nutrition science. In 2015, I, along with many other scientists, were pilloried in the BMJ as being partial to the sugar industry. This article provided no evidence at all of that, but there was considerable insinuation, and subsequent media coverage went quite a lot further. Now, just to be clear, I do no paid work or consultancy for the food industry. But I do talk to them, both as part of my research and previously when I was the independent chair of a group which was set up by government specifically to negotiate agreements with industry to improve the food environment. Now, what this article did was prompt me to make the case in, a, in an article for The Guardian about why scientists and society gain from interactions with the food industry. And I was very honored to be subsequently avoid, uh, uh, awarded the John Maddox Prize for standing up for science. So here's just a couple of extracts from the, the article I wrote at the time, which addressed, I think, two of the sensitive issues about scientists working with the food industry. The first is on the issue of advice. Now, I think we need to recognize that governments urge scientists to use their expertise to benefit the economy, and that will often be through supporting private enterprise. In my case, that means taking the challenge of obesity and diet-related disease right to the boardroom to demonstrate to food businesses why good nutrition needs is so important and why business as usual isn't an option and they need to change some of their production and marketing practices in order to become part of the solution. Advising companies doesn't necessarily mean agreeing with companies all of the time. Second is the question of undertaking research which is funded by industry, and which often raises concerns about conflicts of interest. It's important to remember that we all have biases, but we shouldn't assume that those biases have, have led to wrongdoing in the absence of any evidence. And in fact, I think we should be very pleased that industry is investing in research, and even more importantly, that they collaborate with independent scientists in doing so. Much better that they do that um, rather than doing their work behind closed doors where we don't hear of the fruits of that endeavor. But when it comes to academic industry collaborations, I think there are some basic steps that we can, and indeed we must take, if we're going to try to protect the evidence from the emotion. That starts with full transparency of funding sources, whether it's from industry or other bodies who themselves will have their own vested interests. I think it's important, too, that we separate out research funding from personal salary support of people employed in public institutions. But we also need to recognize that some conflicts are not financial, 
We need to take care that a focus on funding doesn't blind us to some of the other very important biases in the system. One of the crucial ones is that scientists really make sure that the goals of their research are aligned with societal interests. That means we need scientists to use their judgment about whether the research that's being proposed is or sometimes is not in the public interest and to guard against diversionary tactics by industry. And as always, research must be carried out to the highest possible standards. That means pre-publication of protocols, not just for trials, but also for experimental research. And I think the time is right for pre-specified analyses to become a standard part of nutrition epidemiology too. And that transparency needs to extend to the publication of results. In my view, contracts between scientists in public institutions and other bodies should always include an independent right to publish. I could go on, but I'm really pleased that these issues about conflict of interest are now being considered and taken very seriously by groups like the Academy of Medical Sciences. Because more than anything, I wish there were clear governance frameworks for scientists to follow as otherwise, everybody is trying to make it up for themselves, and even when you mean to do it right, you can sometimes get it wrong. So, enough preamble. For whatever reason, despite all the research that's been conducted in the past in the diet and health arena, the fact remains that progress towards dietary targets is depressingly slow. Here you can see the changes that have occurred over a decade in the UK, that's the blue to the red lines, in comparison with the targets, which are shown in green. And as you'll see, there's still a good way to go. So given all the attention on food, why are we not doing better? Is this a failure of science? Is it a failure of policy making? Is the food industry responsible? Or is it that consumers are just actively resisting all we do to try to encourage change? So what I want to do today is to try to tell you about some of my own research and look at areas where the science has or perhaps could make a real difference to policy and practice. And I want to consider how that plays out both in the health system but also within the food industry. So first, I want to look at interventions to treat obesity and second, at a range of initiatives which might improve diet quality and reduce the more general burden of diet-related disease. So let's start with obesity. Now, over the last five years or so, my research team have published a whole series of reviews which have looked at different types of interventions which might be used to treat obesity. The prevailing narrative, of course, is that diets don't work. But in fact, the evidence shows quite the opposite. Each one of these reviews shows clear evidence that when we offer people support to lose weight, they actually do surprisingly well. Interventions to treat obesity really do work. Let me just show you two examples, which are two of our own trials. So the first one relates to the effectiveness of community weight loss groups run by commercial providers um, in the community, so things like Weight Watchers. Now, in the UK, um, doctors can refer patients to these services, and this is probably one of the mainstays of um, obesity treatment within the National Health Service. But typically, patients are referred for just 12 weeks. And if you talk to most public health professionals or doctors, what they'll say to you is, 12 weeks, is that really enough? Surely it would be better to give people access to a longer treatment program. And so that's the question we specifically set up to address. And so we compared referring people for 12 weeks to a commercial provider or for a whole year. And we compared each of these to what we call brief advice which was essentially the doctor providing people with an information leaflet. And the critical thing we were interested in is not only the clinical effectiveness, how much weight do people lose, but also the cost effectiveness. And here are the results. So the first thing to notice is that all three groups lost weight, 
So this is 1,200 people. And on average, whichever group you were in, people lost weight, even when we followed them up after two years. Remember that in the brief advice group, they'd have been given a leaflet on day one. But they lost uh, more than two kilos, even two years later. The people who were referred to the provider lost more weight. And, as you might expect, the longer intervention led to greater weight loss. Almost seven kilograms at one year, and still four kilos two years later. So for most practitioners, this conclusion seemed pretty obvious. Longer is better. But the key question that policymakers wanted me to answer is which is the best value for money? So here we see the cost-effectiveness analysis. And what we've done here is to model the impact over 25 years using established long-term health models. Because, of course, we treat obesity today with all the costs that that entails in order to prevent other diseases occurring further down the line. So you need to take that longer-term perspective. And by the way, in these analyses, we assume that people continue to regain weight and that by five years, they're back to their baseline. So we're trying to make a pretty conservative estimate. We're not pretending that this will cure obesity forever. But what you see in the hatched bars is the cost of the intervention. So unsurprisingly, the longer treatment costs more. What you see in the white bars is the cost savings that we project will be um, recouped over time because of fewer cases of diabetes, high blood pressure, and so forth. And if we then combine the two, you can see the net effect shown in the solid blue bar. What's clear is that if we take a 25-year time horizon, actually offering people a 12-week program is actually cost-saving. Hardly anything we do in health is actually cost-saving, but this really could be. In contrast, the longer program, although it is better for individuals, is not better for society as a whole. It's more expensive. And so the answer for policymakers is it's better to take a fixed pot of money and use it to treat more people with a shorter, cheaper intervention than to uh, narrow it down to just a few individuals treated for longer. Now, the cost savings, as I've mentioned, primarily come from population-level reductions in cardiovascular disease risk. But if you're a patient or indeed a clinician, the benefits at an individual level can seem rather small. So these are the sort of benefits you can expect to achieve if you lose just 10% of your body weight. So we're talking about maybe the impact of about half a tablet to treat blood pressure. And that's not the kind of thing which is going to make most doctors you know, jump up in, uh, in great excitement. And so we've been trying to look for more effective interventions. So I want to tell you about a second trial which we published quite recently in the British Medical Journal. And here we tested something called a total diet replacement program. So this is a diet which is based on specially formulated and nutritionally complete soup shakes and bars. And we ask people to go on this regimen in place of their usual food for around about eight weeks. And after that, they have, well, during that time and afterwards, they have individual counseling in order to firstly motivate them to stick to the diet and secondly to help them back into regular eating and hopefully to establish a healthier eating pattern after a period of time away when they've hopefully broken some old habits. So in this trial, we looked at the effectiveness of these programs for the routine treatment of obesity. If people who were overweight came to see their doctor, would this be a reasonable treatment to offer? And to be honest, what we were most concerned about is that the rigor of this intervention might mean it was unacceptable to many, many people. But in fact, what we saw is a phenomenal result. So the weight losses, and this is done on what we call an intention-to-treat basis, so it's the average of absolutely everybody who was randomized to that treatment, whether they attended the program or not, showed that typically people lost 10.7 kilograms at one year. And again, remember that the diet itself finished much earlier. It was only an eight-week program with four weeks in which we reintroduced normal food. 
And that weight loss was more than seven kilograms greater than we saw in usual care. That's referring people to a practice nurse. Perhaps even more interestingly, if you look down at the bottom, what you can see is that 45% of people in the total diet replacement arm lost more than 10% of their initial body weight. And this kind of program, although it is more expensive than something like Weight Watchers, is still highly cost-effective by the usual standards we apply for treatment within the NHS. And if I put this result into a more clinical context, this is another paper which was published shortly before ours, which used a very, very similar type of diet, but this time specifically for people who already had type 2 diabetes. What they saw here is very similar weight losses, 10 kilos at one year. And of all the people randomized to this treatment, 45% were free of their diabetes at one year. They were in remission. If you look in more detail at the relationship between weight loss and diabetes remission, it's really quite remarkable. Because what you see is that people who lost more than 15 kilos, those for whom this really was a very acceptable and appropriate intervention, 83% of them were free from diabetes at one year. Now, this is likely to just be remission, but nonetheless, even a year or more without diabetes is going to be great for individuals, but also going to be very, very good for health services too. Now, if you want the ultimate evidence that um, embarking on a weight loss intervention is worthwhile, even acknowledging that many people do regain weight, it comes from this systematic review by Alison Avenal. And what Alison did was to take all the trials she could find of so-called behavioral weight management programs, and she looked at the number of people who died during the follow-up period. What she was able to show is that amongst people who'd been randomized to the active intervention arm, to the weight loss group, actually six, oops, sorry, six fewer people per thousand uh, were likely to die over the follow-up period. So what I hope I've shown you is that we can treat obesity successfully. It's good for patients, it's clinically effective, it's cost-effective for the health system. It leads to reductions in disease incidence, it can help remission of some other conditions, and it reduces premature mortality. This is a very effective intervention to improve the health of the nation. That should be a fantastic good news story. Um, and a real success for medical science. But actually, in a blog I wrote recently, I'm really not celebrating just yet. And the reason is that it's an incredibly sad fact that most people who could benefit from these kinds of interventions simply don't get access to them. It's not a routine part of medical care. And you can hear much more about this in a short video that I did recently for the Academy of Medical Sciences, where I really came to the conclusion that sadly we have a, um, it's the system which is failing to offer support to people to lose weight. And that's in stark contrast with the prevailing narrative, which is that it's patients who fail to lose weight. Actually, patients do very, very well when we offer them support. The challenge is how do we actually implement this evidence in practice? And I think as scientists, we need to face up to a very hard truth, and that is that evidence alone simply is not sufficient to change policy and practice. And that's certainly been a lesson that I've really taken to heart, and we're putting more effort than ever before into the implementation of our research findings. We're working hard to convince policymakers at both local and national levels to develop systems to support obesity treatment as a cost-effective strategy to prevent diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And I was delighted to hear our Secretary of State for Health in the UK on the radio this morning talking about a new investment in prevention so that we genuinely turn our NHS into a national health service where promoting health is just as important as treating disease. But it's not just about changing the attitudes amongst policymakers, it's also about training and motivating practitioners. Because at the moment, treating obesity 
is really not a standard part of medical culture. Doctors are much more likely to treat the consequences of obesity rather than to actually treat the underlying cause. And finally, we've also got to win over the public too. And there's a real public perception issue about the importance of obesity treatment. And so we've been doing quite a lot of high-profile media work, which is trying to make the case to the public, firstly, that obesity really is a very significant health risk, and secondly, and much more positively, that there are interventions which are effective. So, so far, I've really been talking about individual-level interventions, things which are designed to motivate and empower people to make change, effectively to help them to push the boulder up what is, in, fa in fact, rather a pretty, uh, pretty steep hill. And we're now beginning to extend our research to support individuals beyond obesity, to look at interventions to help people reduce the amount of saturated fat, sugar, and salt in their diet, including collaborations with retailers, where we try to offer people much more personalized advice and support to help them to make healthier choices, actually, when they're in doing their grocery shopping. The advantage of that is it helps to take health outside of the health system and put it into our everyday lives and into the everyday choices people are making, which are having those long-term consequences for their health. But we also need to make it much less of an uphill task. Healthy eating should not be this hard. And so what I think we also need to think about is population-level interventions, which effectively are going to make the gradient a little bit less steep. Let's just make it a bit easier so that the healthier choice becomes the easy choice. This is important because although we like to think of ourselves as rational, intelligent people, research shows us that when it comes to food, we don't engage that Einstein bit of our brain, which demands time and cognitive effort. Instead, much of our behavior in relationship to food uses what my students call the Homer Simpson part of the brain, where we just go with the flow, and where our eating behavior is simply an automatic response shaped by the environment that surrounds us. It follows, therefore, that if we change the environment, perhaps a healthier diet wouldn't be so hard for individuals to achieve. Now, there are many ways to conceptualize public health action to change the food environment, and this is the one that I favor, thinking of people, products, promotions, price, and place, and I'm going to touch briefly on most of those. After many years of really concerted effort by academics and indeed the NGOs, the UK finally got agreement in 2012 from about two-thirds of the prepackaged food industry to introduce a consistent, color-coded, front-of-pack nutritional label. Now, this hasn't proved quite so popular with all of our European neighbors, but nonetheless, it's a system which is working, I think, very well in the UK now. And what we've seen more recently is government announced proposals for mandatory calorie labeling on menus so that we start to address the food that people consume outside the home as well. And I'd like to think that that effort has been stimulated in part by our recent Cochrane review. So this was a big systematic review which tried to synthesize all of the available evidence to what extent calorie labeling on menus actually changed what people eat. Because frankly, there's no point investing a whole load of political capital in moving forward with something like this if we don't think it's going to have the desired effect. But what this review of the literature showed is that there really is every reason to be confident that although the number and quality of studies is somewhat limited, those that exist do show a significant effect of calorie labeling on menus. Indeed, if the evidence which is collected mostly in the laboratory transfers into the field, we might expect a reduction in the energy content of food purchases of about 8%. Turning now to products, we know both from hard evidence but also from our own experience that portion sizes have increased over time. And I was very struck by this example of even just the increase in the size, in the size of slices of bread. 
which if that was to, you know, if we were all to have two slices of bread every day, we'd get an extra 7,000 calories a year. We've conducted another Cochrane review to examine the impact that increases in portion size have on the amount of energy that people consume. I don't expect you to read the detail, but you can see that a lot of scientists have been very busy studying this because there's a great many studies. And when we look at those, what we conclude is that smaller portions could reduce the amount of energy consumed by up to as much as 16% for adults. Now, that figure came from comparing two different sizes of food which had been offered in experimental situations. But when we did the review, I was very struck by the fact that most of the portions were on the large to very large size, rather than genuinely looking what would happen if people were offered smaller portions, genuinely smaller portions. Because, of course, the risk is you might have less at that meal, but maybe you would just compensate and eat more later. And so to try to address that very specific question, we set up a research study to examine that, which was done by one of my PhD students, Hannah Lewis. So we brought people into the laboratory on three occasions, and they had a breakfast of varying size. And what we then did was to keep them in the lab for the rest of the day, distracted by a whole series of other small tasks. Um, and what we were doing was covertly measuring how much food they ate over the course of the day. And you see the results here. So what we have at the bottom is how much they ate in their evening meal, and this is how much they ate in their lunch meal. What you can see, regardless of which day they came in, this was basically the same. And so the effect of the intervention, which had been breakfast of three different sizes, persisted throughout the whole day. So on the day where we gave them a very small breakfast, they didn't make up for it later on. They ate the same lunch after a small breakfast as they ate after a large breakfast. And so these smaller portion sizes at breakfast actually produced a day-long reduction in energy intake suggesting that if we were to systematically reduce the sizes of portions of food, we would get a, an impact on overall consumption. And I'm pleased to say that we have seen industry start to take action on portion size. For example, as part of the um, uh, network that I mentioned earlier, the Responsibility Deal Food Network, where we were negotiating um, agreements with business to improve the food environment, the main chocolate manufacturers in the UK came together and agreed to have a 250 calorie cap on individual servings of confectionery. And there has, without doubt, been a notable downsizing of bars of chocolate in the UK. And we've seen it in some other brands too. But the problem is that this is not publicly all that acceptable, and there has been a very significant uh, backlash, although it is often short-lived. But for the most part, people are somewhat averse to being offered smaller portions. And I think it's a very good example of how we have to win over public acceptability and public understanding in order to be able to be in a position where policymakers might start to introduce uh, uh, more stringent actions. Much more popular with everybody has been what's sometimes called the health by stealth agenda. This is something which is about reformulation. This has really been the main policy lever that we've used in the UK over the last decade to try to reduce the amount of saturated fat, sugar, and salt that um, are found in most of the nation's favorite foods. And without doubt, there have been some very notable individual successes. And this has been a purely voluntary scheme. But we've seen reductions in the amount of salt in bread and in many breakfast cereals by over 50%. And in some cases now, we're seeing reductions in, in sugar and in saturated fat. So the example from Walkers, for instance, came from them making a company-wide decision to change the type of oil in which they fried their crisps. And that brought about an 85% an reduction in the amount of saturated fat in, in crisps. Huge population level, level gains. But it's all very well to think of these individual products, but what we need to know is what's happening to the overall category. And so I want to take a closer look at sugar, which has been so much in the news of late. Oops. <laughs> 
So in 2016, Public Health England, our uh, public health agency, set specific targets for the food industry to reduce the amount of sugar in 10 categories, which, if you put them together, represent about a quarter of all the sugar in children's diets. And they set a goal to reduce it by 5% in the first year, leading towards a 20% reduction by 2020. So how are we doing? Well, here's the analysis from the first year of the program. And what we can see is that all that was achieved in the first year was a 2% decrease. That's set against the 5% target. And that headline conceals considerable variability. So we've seen really good progress, for example, in breakfast cereals and yogurts, but there's been little or no change at all in confectionery. So we may have smaller bars, and indeed chocolate is down slightly, but there's been an explosion of sweets, including sharing bags and sweets in so many different shops. So at the time when we've been encouraging grocery stores to chuck sweets off the checkout, what I now find is when I go into a dress shop or a DIY shop, in fact, sweets have actually crept on to the checkout. The sheer availability drives consumption. And what we're seeing is really very little or no reduction in sugar intake from confectionery, despite these voluntary targets. Now, in the UK, we've set great store by voluntary measures, and that's really been encouraged by the experience we had with salt. So we set voluntary um, targets for salt back in, I think, 2005. And we've seen salt intakes in the UK come down by more than 15% in a decade. And that is almost entirely down to industry reformulation. Um, and this is generally hailed as a great success. But on the other hand, some of my public health colleagues will say, but mandation would have been better. What if we hadn't set a voluntary target, an aspirational target? What if government had insisted and mandated that industry reduced the salt in its products? Would we have been better off? And the question for scientists, I think, is how can we know? Whether it's, uh, mandatory or, uh, whether it's voluntary or regulatory, monitoring and evaluation is going to be absolutely crucial to know how successful have these policies been. And Barry Popkin's team in the United States have made really sterling efforts to measure some of the work that's been done in America. But nonetheless, the results are still open to interpretation. And I want to show that data to you and leave you to make up your own mind about whether or not this has been a success. So this is the US Healthy Weight Commitment, where many of the very large manufacturers made a commitment to take calories out of the system. Calories, after all, are what are fueling the rise in obesity. So they committed to reduce their calorie footprint. And so what you see here at first sight, I think, looks very positive indeed. There was an 87 calorie per day reduction in the calories purchased from grocery stores. And the bulk of that, as you see at the bottom, was from companies which had signed up to this healthy weight commitment. So far, so good. But what's the counterfactual? What would have happened if there hadn't been a healthy weight commitment? Truth is, neither you or I know the answer to that, so we can only make some inferences. So what Barry and his team did was look at what was happening to calories purchased in the time preceding the healthy weight commitment. And what you can see is it was, in fact, decreasing. So was the decline that we saw after the commitments had been made, was that a success or not? Well, if you think the previous decline was on a linear trend, then it's been brilliantly successful. If, however, you think it was an accelerating trend, and in fact, it was a quadratic function, then basically the companies have just about stayed on trend. We simply cannot know what would have happened if we tried to stimulate change in a different way. In the current economic climate, I think it's almost inevitable that there will still continue to be a strong reliance on voluntary action, especially at an EU level, where if we were to mandate anything, it would require such extensive intergovernment cooperation. 
So I think the question we have to ask is, if we want to, how might we accelerate voluntary action? And who else really holds the levers of power over the food industry if government are not going to exert that, um, that action? And I think one interesting group is the investment community. So we did a little bit of work with uh, Rathbones and Schroders, two big um, investment companies, who launched a report a couple of years ago um, about the need for change towards more socially responsible practices in the food industry. I think they're keen to do that. They recognize that food is becoming an increasingly risky um, investment. But if we want them to shift their, um, their assets, then there needs to be more transparency in the system so that investors can see which companies really are making progress and which are not. Where is their investment going to be safest? And what that requires is for us to have some metrics which allow us to assess progress within the food industry. So one of my PhD students, Lauren Bandy, is working on this um, just at the moment. And this is some very preliminary data uh, from her work, which I've taken the precaution of removing the names of the companies um, to uh, offset any uh, legal challenges. So what you see here is still, I think, very interesting. So these are the top um, 10 or so companies which are putting sugar into the system in sugar-sweetened beverages. And what you can instantly see is that the, the biggest manufacturer who's putting the most sugar into the system over the last couple of years has made an 8% decrease in the amount of sugar in their overall products, whereas the next biggest manufacturer has made a 19% decrease. And we produced this data by combining information on the nutritional composition of their products with sales data. We can also look about how the retailers are doing. And what you see is our two biggest retailers have both achieved reductions of more than 40% in the amount of sugar that they are selling in sugary drinks. In some cases, it's because they've withdrawn own brands which contain sugar. In contrast, another retailer over here has actually experienced no change whatsoever. And so you can quickly see that we can start to begin to put some discrimination in the system, and that this information could be used either by investors or by governments to incentivize the most progressive or to, um, or to um, uh, chivvy up or penalize the laggards. And we're now using a very similar methodology to look at a whole range of different products so we can really understand the whole of a company's portfolio. I've talked a lot about voluntary, but I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that it's never going to be a case of voluntary or mandatory. There probably is a place for both of these, depending on what is the specific action you're looking for. The carrot of incentivizing change through voluntary mechanisms, or the stick of mandating change through regulation. And I think we may well find that carrots taste a whole lot sweeter when they're offered by somebody who's carrying a very large stick. So what are the elements of a successful regulatory policy? You know, very often when I do talks, people say, government should do something. But actually, if you put yourself in the seat of a policymaker, it becomes much, much harder to write the detail of that legislation, of what exactly is it that we want that policy to say. And so, um, what I think we need to remember is that if you, want to, if you want regulatory action, what you have to have is political courage to enact it. And that's not always easy, particularly because you have to take public opinion with you. Then you've got to set stretching targets. There's no point having, having a mandatory system if, in fact, the targets are rather weak. You need to monitor progress, and crucially, you've got to be prepared to take action if the targets are not met. Because otherwise, when you come to do this the next time, you'll find that you can't generate the same sort of traction in the system. It is, I think, quite difficult to identify those areas where mandation might be used. But there are a few where I think it could be effective. Essentially, labeling, promotions. Of course, fiscal interventions are always going to have to be done through legislative means. But there's also, I think, opportunities around the control of food procurement or provision in public settings. And uh, we heard Sir Sebastian mention earlier about the work that's been done on school food. 
Schools, public institutions, are places where it is possible for us to lay down very particular standards which have to be adhered to. And of course, there are other public institutions where we could extend that principle to as well. Now, I've talked a bit about labeling, uh, labeling already, so I won't, um, I won't say more about that now. But I think one of the areas where there is a real opportunity for us to consider whether we need mandatory action is in the arena of uh, promotions. Um, this is, I have to say, a very, very sticky wicket. Nearly 40%, 40% of all the food sold in the UK is sold on some kind of promotion. There's nothing Britons like more than a bargain. If it's on promotion, it's very likely to end up in their shopping basket. And so Public Health England have estimated that this leads to an increase in about a fifth of total, uh, total sales. What happens is you get stockpiling at home, and that stockpiling leads to increased consumption. The trouble is, there's always a risk that if we introduce legislation to ban one promotion or another, the marketing spend will shift to somewhere else. So if we ban multi-buys, buy one, get one free, what we might well see is an increase in temporary price reductions, which will drive sales in a different way. And so whilst the food marketeers have a lot of evidence about what changes consumer behavior, actually in the public health community, we don't know nearly so much. So it's very difficult at the moment for us to advise policymakers about what might be the most effective ways to change the promotional landscape. So we've started to take a particular interest in this area, and one thing we've looked at is the impact of positioning in store. So we've been looking at the end of aisle, so sometimes called the gondola end, which is a prime marketing spot in the supermarket because more people go past that spot and because very often you get a single item on that display, so it, it's eye-catching. What we've shown in this analysis, which I won't talk about in, in detail, is that, in fact, if you put uh, beverages on the end of an aisle, you get a marked uplift in sales. So for carbonated drinks, putting it on the end of the aisle increases purchases by more than 50%. That's the same effect as you would get if you dropped the price by more than 20%. So positioning is an absolutely crucial component, and it's an area where, in theory, we could see legislation introduced to restrict sales of unhealthy foods in prime sites in, in grocery stores. Finally, let me just finish with what I think is turning into a real public health success story, and again, we heard a little of this earlier, and that's the issue of taxing sugary drinks. I think the scientific case is now very clearly made that sugary drinks harm health. They increase energy intake and the risk of obesity and diabetes, and they damage teeth. So fiscal measures have now been introduced in more than 28 countries around the world. And as we've heard in the UK, um, there was a, a soft drink industry levy announced in the budget in 2016, which came into effect in April this year. I think rather cleverly, this is actually a tiered levy, and it's a levy which is applied on business. So this was initially popular amongst the public because it looked like a tax on big business and not on individual consumers. But what it's also been able to do is to act as a huge stimulus to reformulation. Because the levy was proportional to the sugar content of drinks, it acted as a stimulus for companies to actually reduce the amount of sugar in their products. And so here's the initial analysis, and this was just done to the end of 2017. So this is three months even before the tax was introduced. But it looks at changes which have occurred in the sugar content of drinks between the announcement in 2016 and the end of 2017. And what you can see is there's been an 11% decrease in the sales-weighted average sugar content of beverages. We haven't yet seen the impact on consumer behavior in the UK. That will come. But what we have been doing in, our, in Oxford is to monitor the prices. Because what's happened is, although companies have reformulated to reduce some of the sugar, they are still exposed to a significant um, levy on the remaining sugar in their product. And what they've done is to pass that on to consumers. 
And as we've seen in other countries where the tax has been introduced, there's a pass-on rate which is almost 100%, somewhere between 90 and 100%. And if the UK follows um, what we've seen in other countries, we can expect that, that, that a 10% increase in price leads to almost a 10% reduction in sales. In fact, the levy in the UK is somewhat bigger. It's closer to 20%. And so we should be able to measure a very significant uh, decrease in, in sugary drinks. So, Based on the, uh, the success, I think, of this strategy, we've seen governments starting to talk much more um, openly about the possibility of extending fiscal measures to other areas um, in order to accelerate sugar reduction strategies. I think it's also been because there's been minimal public disquiet about this. Based on our research, we've suggested that the next, next target should be confectionery. The reason for this is that in, in the economic modeling, this is the modeling for sugary drinks at the top, you can see the effect of a 1% increase in price on the reduction you would see in sugary drinks. And here at the bottom, you see a similar model of what if we put up the price of confectionery by 1%. You get an almost, uh, almost exactly the same reduction in purchases as we would see for sugary drinks. The real win, though, comes from the fact that people get three times as much sugar from confectionery as they do from sugary drinks. So the effect is the same, but it's on a three times bigger, bigger category. So I hope that what I've shown you in these examples is the importance of science to really generate robust evidence of the relationship between diet and health, and then to identify effective actions which might change behavior. And what we need to do is then communicate this to policymakers, industry, and the public, so we create this kind of virtuous circle where consumers are demanding healthier food, and industry is competing to respond and to promote food and drinks in a way which actually encourages further healthier choices. The challenge for government is to put in place the conditions which makes, make this more likely for science, for industry, and for citizens. So just to summarize, I think we have really good evidence of what constitutes a healthy diet, but change is happening only slowly. Individual level interventions to treat obesity are very effective, but we need to scale them up if we're going to deliver public health impact. And population level interventions to support a healthier diet are effective but they're only really going to yield their full potential with political leadership, industry support, and public acceptability. I started off this talk by saying that we need to separate emotion from evidence, and I do stand by that. But I think as scientists, we also need to understand that evidence alone is not sufficient to change policy and practice. And we need to do more to understand the social and the political economy in which we operate so that we win hearts and minds too. I am confident that that's possible. Almost everybody in their calm, rational moments wants to be healthy. But at present, there are just too many stumbling blocks for most people to be successful in achieving a healthier diet in the midst of their busy, complicated lives. You know, in high-income countries like Germany and the UK, the 20th, 20th century goals of more food, more cheaply, have fueled the rise in non-communicable diseases. We have now got to set a different course, and we need to support other countries who are going through the nutrition transition out of food insecurity and deficiency to help them achieve a much more sustainable outcome than we have managed to do in the past. So on that note, thank you to all the people who fund our research, to the home team back in Oxford, and absolutely to all of you for your attention this evening. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Susan, for this very inspiring talk. And I think at least you won our hearts here. So this was a good promotion of your <laughs> last slide. And we saw very interesting figures on both the individual treatment and the population system-based interventions. But this is now the time for the auditorium to 
maybe if, you know, there's some specific questions, maybe also on transferability to Germany or some other examples. Don't give a second speak, speech, please, but come up with sharp and witty questions. We have microphones in the room, and so it's a bit difficult to see you from here, but please raise your hands so that I can see you and somebody's coming with a microphone. I think there's a lady in the front here. Where? Where you? You see? Oh, is, is there some? Over there? No? Oh, no, I thought there was somebody. Back That's there, back guess. there, yes. Person standing up, waving. Yes, please. It's very hard to see here. Yeah? yeah, it's totally difficult to see. Hello, and thank you. My name is Johanna, and uh, I have a question about uh, the carrot you mentioned. It, uh, I read that even vegetables like carrots and tom tomatoes have a lot of sugar in it, which is really unhealthy because it's fructose, and fructose as a red uh, goes directly into the liver and uh, develops to fat around the organs. And my question is, don't you think that even vegetables and fruits nowadays are as unhealthy as all the other things you mentioned? And another question would be, don't you think that especially poor people would suffer because 90% of what you get in a supermarket is full of sugar? So, uh, Carrot, you know, carrots and fruits, yes, they do contain sugar, but quantitatively, it is very, very small indeed compared to the much more concentrated sugar that we see, which is added to foods. So I think we, um, what we really want is to reduce the sugar that's added to foods and actually to get back to help people to enjoy the natural sweetness that comes from, from fruit, for example. So, uh, you know, we have to really think about quantitatively where, where is the problem. And people are mostly, you know, I'm not worried about people eating too many carrots, but I am worried about them eating too much confectionery. And do you want to say something, Susan, about the, that, the, that the artificial fructose is different than the fructose derived from the carrots? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, uh, that would be a long story. <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody else? Please. There was a, yes, here in front. So thank you also for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, what I am wondering is um, when industrial follows the call to reduce the critical values in their products, is there any monitoring how they do it? So what I'm wondering is, when I have these three colors on the food, and industry will do everything probably to have a lot of green in there. So reduce sugar, but put a lot of sweetener in there. Are there any studies about this? So, so this is exactly the reason why monitoring is so important. Um, so firstly, we have to think very hard about the framework in which we um, ask industry to operate, because they are generally pretty good in sticking to, to, the, to the rules. If this is what we say we want, that's what they will try, try to deliver. So we need to be clear about what the ask is, what's allowed and what's not allowed. Then we need to monitor what's actually happening. Now, the issue... Um, in particular is that, that you raised is around um, uh, artificial sweeteners, for example. So we know that that's a good way of reducing the amount of sugar, so it reduces calories. Um, so that's, that's important, that's a, a real step forward. Of course, the challenge is that it still um, retains the sweetness, and so it continues to reinforce preferences for the sweet foods. So it's what I think we might consider as a harm reduction strategy. It's a great deal better than having a full sugar product. But if we take the example of beverages, for example, it's better to move from a full sugar beverage to um, a, a sweetened, uh, an artificially sweetened beverage. But if you're already drinking water, then for sure don't trade up. Thank you. We now move over, over here, yes, please. Hi, I find your whole presentation really interesting. And I have two questions. The first one, um, 
it seems to me like um, the overall caloric reduction is very important, just in general, this whole caloric reduction. I wonder if there is any individual differences. Maybe some people react better to this kind of diet than others. And I think I read a Guardian article which suggests that, you know, dietary changes do not affect people in the same way. So that's my first question. And my second question would be, um, it seems to me that you don't really see that sugar is such a big evil that it sets out to be. And I'm, I'm not too sure about that because um, the thing is, I read this article about how high fructose corn syrup, the invention of high fructose corn syrup, I think about 30 or 40 years ago, it coincides with this you know, increase in obesity that we see today. Yep. And there's a lot of hidden sugars in many things, for example, yogurt. We don't think of yogurt as something yep. that's you know, with a lot of sugar, but there is a lot of sugar in there. So okay. I, I really want to know what is your opinion on these okay. two issues. Yep. So you're absolutely right. In terms of obesity, calories are really the important thing. And so what we have to do is achieve a net reduction in calories. And we can do that by reducing sugar. We can do it by reducing uh, fat. We can do it just by reducing portion size. We've just got to get people to consume less. Now, clearly, some calories have nutritional benefits to them. You know, the calories in fruit and vegetables come with lots of positive nutrition. The calories that come from sugar bring calories and nothing more. So in a world where we're trying to reduce calories, it makes absolute sense to reduce those foods which are calories and, and nothing else. I really don't want people to go away thinking that sugar is fine. Sugar is absolutely not fine. We're eating far too much sugar. But my point is, we are also eating too many calories, and those calories come from things other than sugar as well. So let's not get so obsessed with just one thing that we forget the bigger picture. In fact, when people are eating foods, they don't really eat just sugar. OK, sugary drinks are just sugar. But everything else is a mixture. Biscuits, cakes, chocolate, confectionery, that's fat, and it's sugar. And, and it's other kinds of carbohydrate too. So let's be realistic that there are some foods we want people to eat less of, and that will help us to reduce fat, sugar, and calories. Um, and I think it's much better to focus on that rather than on individual nutrients. Now, the issue of high fructose corn syrups come up a couple of times, so let me specifically address that. So high fructose corn syrup used extensively in the United States, and lots of people point to the ecological, um, the, to, the, to the trends. As, as consumption went up, so did obesity. But actually, obesity went up as sales of, uh, you know, trainers went up. These kinds of ecological analyses are incredibly weak because so many other things have happened. High fructose corn syrup contains 55% fructose. Sucrose, regular sucrose, regular sugar, contains 50% fructose. So there really is only a marginal difference between high fructose corn syrup and sugar. This is mostly an issue about added sugar, because actually we consume far more added sugar than we do high fructose corn syrup. And I think there's very little evidence that high fructose corn syrup has effects over and above sugar. Um, it's, uh, you know, you have to, fructose does, does impact on the liver, but only when it's given at levels which greatly exceed what people are, are typically consuming. Um, this is an issue of total calories, and, it, and too many calories leads to obesity, which leads to insulin resistance, and that's really um, at the heart of this whole problem. We have one question here. Yeah, I, I wonder if you could maybe contextualize the importance of uh, food consumption in relation to other forms of battling obesity. I'm talking about lifestyles, the way we work, the way we sure. move through the city, uh, the, where we live, and, and all this. Thank you. So you're absolutely right. Obesity is about more than, more than just diet. I think I was in the part of my talk when I was talking about obesity, it was mostly about treatment. And we know that when it comes to treatment, the dietary change is absolutely the cornerstone. Increasing physical activity will bring additional benefits, and of course, metabolically, it's very, very helpful. But in terms of losing weight, diet, diet's crucial. If we think about broader prevention, so the primary prevention of obesity, then physical activity and diet are both, are both really critical elements. One of the reasons why we are 
so likely now to overconsume calories is because our energy expenditure has plummeted to incredibly low levels. And so if we want to tackle this at a population level, it makes no sense at all to only focus on diet. We absolutely need to, pr be, to be promoting physically active lifestyles as well. Um, not least, you know, it will burn off extra calories. But in addition, I think there is some evidence which suggests that if you're more physically active, your natural innate appetite control systems start to work a little bit more efficiently, and you may be better able to match your calorie intake to your energy expenditure if you're more physically active. So I'm a huge advocate for physical activity, for weight control, but also to reduce the metabolic consequences of obesity. It's just that as a nutrition scientist, I guess I'm trying to um, stick to my own topic and not stray too far into other people's. We have one more question there and the last one over here. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the interesting talk and for bringing this important topic to us. Uh, I have a question from one of your very first slides. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the evidence shows that eating more whole grains and more vegetables uh, are some of the largest problems we have, and sugar was much lower down on the, on the list. So can we talk about that for a moment? You sounds like you've worked with industry quite a bit. I'm curious if you have done any work or if you know any evidence or any methods to get industry to encourage people to eat more whole grains and vegetables. These things are more filling, mm. Mm. and you probably eat fewer calories if you're more sated from these other types of foods. So that analysis I showed you is from the Global Burden of Disease Study. It's done from big, collating big epidemiological cohorts. Um, you know, we can debate about the quality of the, um, of the measures of dietary intake that underpin that. But nonetheless, putting all of those possible caveats to one side, I think few people would um, deny that increasing more fruit and eating more fruit and vegetables and more fiber would improve health. And the most important source of fiber in our diet is, is cereal fiber. People who get a lot of fiber are people who are having wholemeal bread or whole grain breakfast cereals. Those are the principal sources. Um, it's interesting that public policy has tended not to focus so much on whole grain. And I think that's partly because, of course, if people were to just add that into their diet, what we would do is increase calorie intake. And so the message to, um, has to be about substitution. What we need there is for people to transition from highly refined sources, highly refined bread and cereals, into whole grain sources. And that's a slightly difficult and trickier message. We've certainly seen a lot of marketing by some, particularly the breakfast cereal companies around whole grain breakfast cereals, but it is proving um, almost as hard to get people to eat more fiber as it is to get them to eat less, less sugar. The issue about fruit and veg is, is, a, is a, a, a tricky one. Um, what we've seen over time is there've been some, we've had huge public health campaigns about increasing more fruit and veg, and everybody knows it's good for you. But, um, Again, it, it's evidence that knowledge alone isn't sufficient to change behavior. There's been some increases in fruit, but vegetables, vegetables are harder. Um, and a lot of that is about social norms and culture and about our early life experiences. If you don't eat vegetables as a child, it's quite difficult to get into that later. People have to learn preparation and cooking skills. And they're often perceived as being expensive and therefore a, a sort of discretionary addition to the diet rather than in, an integral part of it. So I think the, um, if you like, the behavioral strategies to help people to eat more uh, vegetables are going to be somewhat different than the kinds of actions that I've talked about today, which have been focused on, on limiting uh, nutrients of concern. But nonetheless, one could still approach it, the problem, in a similar kind of framework. What do we need to do for people, products, promotions, places, and so forth? And certainly on places in the UK, we put a big emphasis now 
on providing um, access to fruit and particularly vegetables in schools in order to try to make them more normal and also to use a little bit of peer pressure because there will be some children who are accustomed to eating vegetables. And, uh, you know, as every mother knows, if you've got a, uh, a child who's a fussy eater, the best thing to do is to send them to have supper with a friend who eats well. And then you'll suddenly find that they're far more likely to um, eat their broccoli. OK, the last question. I Don't think my question, question um, fits uh, neatly with what you just said. It's a question concerning the societal aspects and how do you win the battle of the hearts and minds? Because I do remember when Jamie Oliver introduced the uh, healthy diet in schools, there were all these pictures and the tabloids of mothers handing chocolate bars and chips to their children mm. who might be hungry at school and wouldn't have proper food. So, um, you know, I saw all that. It's all very rational. It's very sensible. But how do you... Um, well, how do you tackle the question of, you know, is this just another case of the educated classes yeah. telling the less educated classes now even what they should eat? You know, is this another question of the nanny state and, you know, isn't there resistance from those who mm -hmm. think, you know, uh, fries and uh, chips and fry, uh, uh, fish and chips are a wonderful diet on a daily yeah. basis? Well, it's all about the power of the narrative and uh, the fact that you can recall those um, dreadful scenes of people pushing um, unhealthy products through the school gates happened on one day in one school, but became a worldwide phenomenon. And so we, um, I think, have got to get much smarter in our public health messaging. And I think there are two aspects we need to talk about. One is healthy eating cannot be seen as an extreme sport. You know, if healthy eating is all about chai seeds and goji berries, we are going to alienate most of the population. And we kind of need to get back to some basic fundamentals about what we mean by a healthy diet. So I think we've really got to keep ourselves firmly grounded in, in the everyday reality of people's lives and not some, you know, fanciful um, uh, ideas. The, um, the second thing is... I thought it was my second thing. It was one about grounding, it was about the narrative, grounding it into people's everyday lives, and also making it enjoyable. You know, healthy eating should not be a punitive action. Those of us who enjoy a healthy diet know the deliciousness of fresh, seasonal fruit and vegetables, about valuing the sort of quality of products rather than the, rather than the quantity. Healthy eating is not a punitive thing, but... We often sell it like that. We talk about it as being, a, oh, the healthy option. And, you know, we're learning through social marketing that actually, if on a menu you write, you, you put something on the menu labeled as the healthy option, very few people take it up. If you put it on the menu as dish of the day, it's surprisingly popular. Um, and so we've just got to get smarter about marketing healthy eating. Um, and I think that, you know, Collectively, we, we, could do, we could do much more. Quite why we are so squeamish about talking about what people eat, I, I don't entirely know. Um, you know, we, we've got to a point now where governments feel it's fine to tell people they can't have a plastic straw. I, it's not that I want to, you know, defend plastic straws, but, but, but government feels that's perfectly reasonable for them to intervene in that. Actually, is it not also reasonable to intervene in people's food choices, at least in offering, um, you know, advice uh, uh, about a healthy diet? I don't see why that is a nanny state when so much of everything else government does, which is to um, frame the way we live our lives, is apparently okay. So, um, yeah, I think we can do it, but we've got to change the, the narrative. Susan, thanks again for these great answers to the great questions. And I hand back to our president. Thank so thank you again thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent talk, and I appreciate in particular the policy-making aspect that you introduced us. We have an Urkunde um, to give to Professor Susan Jeb. I forgot the English word, I'm sorry. Um, it's about the Queen's Beautiful. Lecture, yes, um, and it has the title of your lecture, and we thank you very much for thank having you. this lecture. Thank you very much indeed.
And <laughs> since you didn't talk badly about sugar in, in the end, <laughs> this is a 3D print. It's not actually sugar of a piece of sugar that we would like to give to you. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. And finally, like an if, if I may ask the ambassador to come up to the stage once more. We have a small present for you, oh my which goodness. is, it's actually a print from the Palais Strausberg. And if I'm correct, the British Embassy moved into this palais in 1876. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. So we thought this is from our collection, from our um, architecture print collection, wow. which is quite famous, to give you one if you're strong enough to hold it. It's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> it's very generous. Yeah. Shall, shall we yeah. take it back here? Sure. Okay. So that's it. You're all invited to come to upstairs in the Lichthof in the auditorium um, for a small reception. Thank you. Great. Thank you.